Welcome back to Magical Woman. I'm your host, Connie Boyd, and this week I'm speaking to Billy Kidd, and this is part two of our conversation. You've been cast into a lot of different television shows. First of all, how do you adapt your performances from, well, you do so many different genres, but let's say live performance street magic to television magic because they're dramatically different in, in how you would prepare, what you would present. Can you provide mm-hmm. us a bit of insight or what, what your experiences have been? Yeah, so like, yeah, for, for basically transferring magic, like re- live stage magic, close-up magic to, to television um, is very different. Uh, and it's hard. It, it's almost like it's a different technique altogether. So first of all, you can't misdirect a camera. So you have to really start, you really have to know your material. And this is why I think learning the history of magic and really knowing about magic in general is to your advantage, especially in these situations. Um, one thing that always happens whenever you're doing magic for television, they usually want a VT or something up here. So all of a sudden you have to do tricks that are like chest high up like this, which is not normal. And there's only so many routines that you can perform like this that are going to look even good for a camera. So I would have like a list of a bunch of different tricks, whether I do them in real life or not, that are specifically for this environment. Right. So just as a, just as like a, a library of, of what those routines are is, is really, really helpful. Um, the advantage of magic on television, as probably most people have figured out or know, is that you have a team of people behind the camera. Mm-hmm. So if you're lucky enough to have magic consultants, you can do magic for, for people and for an, a real live audience in front of the camera. And it's all legit. It's all real. And there's nothing stupid or anything about that. But because you can control what the camera is seeing, you can get away with other things, if that makes sense. It, it uh, does make sense. Even with where we are today in 2020, doing Zoom chats, doing um, uh, any kind of uh, media chat, you're, you're within this, this parameter. So you can, it's the same premise, basically. Yeah. I could have someone behind my camera, you know, feeding me stuff underneath that you'll never know because of the frame. Right. Um, but, there are, but there are sneaky ways of doing kind of that idea. But even if you have a live audience or a live puncher with you who's, who doesn't know that you've got a team of people working, even though they are aware of a camera there. So there's, an, there's ad- advantages because of that. So you can do different types of magic just by that one advantage. Mm-hmm. Um, but then also the disadvantages is really not all magic works for the camera because it's not really the medium I think magic was supposed to be in originally right. or how a lot of routines are created. So, so yeah, I enjoy doing a lot of television magic because it's a different challenge. It's not something you get to do every day right. and uh, it just exercises another muscle in your brain really. Yeah. And how, um, how hands-on in general are you as far as the, the material you present? Do, do they give you specific parameters of what they're looking for and you say, I can perform this, that, and the other, or do they say, we would like this or can both? It's, it depends entirely on the type of show that I'm doing. So if it's like, uh, for example, like ITV uh, over here, we did a, a program called The Next Great Magician. And they had a bunch of different scenarios for us. Like you could either be sh- shot live with a live studio audience, um, or you could be shot somewhere on a closed set somewhere else. So you have got more control of the environment. And it kind of de- it kind of depended and catered towards each person's routines. And we had about three months prepping for that show. Okay. Uh, so yeah, going back to my trapeze routine, they yeah. requested, could I do that again? I was like, well, it's, it's, it's been about eight years since I've done that routine. And uh, obviously another little tip for television magic is try not to do card tricks because every magician is going to pull out a deck of cards right. and every producer is going to be like, we've seen enough card tricks. We want something different. So, so I did a completely right. different routine on the trapeze for this television show. So it, it, it's very different. It's where very then, different. <laughs> yeah, every sh- it depends on what the show is, right? So then like um, the show I hosted on Discovery Channel, that was very different because it was about taking a, a science experiment, which already exists, mm-hmm. and making it l- look like magic or present it as a magic trick. Right. So pretty much all the stuff we did on that was was ne- had never been done in the way uh, we presented the science before. So so we were creating something from scratch, but we also had a team of writers. We had uh, consultants who we were writing with. Yeah. So yeah, every show is different, but but if you're interested in doing television magic, have a list of things you could do that's that's like this. Yeah. <laughs> it's 
because that'll be to your advantage and it's good to have that. Mm -hmm. Great advice. Thank you so much. That's, uh, I think that's going to be very helpful for new magicians starting out and just for viewers in general, because uh, there's a lot of insight there that most people wouldn't be aware of. So thank you. How did you transition from performing uh, in your live shows and being cast into your television shows? Did you submit a video? Did you prepare a publicity? Or did people come to see you? And that was the catalyst that led into this uh, different style of, of work. Um, a, a bunch of different things that happened initially, I would say. So the first, the first thing I did was, uh, it was an advert for O2 over here. And simply they were just, they were doing a casting that I somehow heard about. And uh, I contacted them and was like, do you, how many people do you need? Uh, what is the criteria? And they told me it's, uh, they need a male and a female to do different versions of the advert. And it's all kind of close up stuff to this. And they, the criteria for that was come in, perform a trick, and then we'll, we might instruct you to do something. That was basically, that was basically it. So as an actor, doing auditions is second nature to me. So I'm very comfortable in auditions. I know how they work, but I've never been to one as a magician or hence as playing myself before. So that's a totally new experience for me. And, um, and yeah, I got really lucky. I, I got the part in that, but again, I think my advantage was going back to how you asked me, how does my acting influence my magic? Well, there you go. I remember walking into the audition room, looking at the other magicians who I didn't know. This was like my first year in magic. I didn't know who anybody was, right. but I remember looking at just what they were wearing and thinking, they have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, some of it's through casting. Uh, I, I, the Discovery Channel show, I got that through, through a casting as well, where they were just auditioning a bunch of people. Uh, and again, I just know that game. I just know that environment. And, and you have to do a lot of research on the, on the channel and the show. So right. what's the demographic? How do you fit into that? Um, and then a, a lot of other stuff has, has been mostly word of mouth as well. Um, you do one thing, you work with a lot, especially in television, because a lot of your crews and a lot of your producers end up being the same kind of people, or right. they all kind of know each other. Right. So if, you are, if you're easy to work with, yeah. that's going to go a long way. You, yeah, yeah you got to put your ego aside. And that is something I, I would, I notice the most with magicians, is magicians, we, we're mostly used to working alone. So we're not used to working in a collaborative environment, especially on a set, TV set, right. which are two two different things. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know how to work with people in a collaborative environment, that means like sharing and taking, um, you're going to be difficult to work with. And I see that a lot, mostly with magicians comparing to actors where actors where all we do is work with other people. Right. So that is another advantage I say I do pull from is I know immediately the problems. Um, if it's, it's a pure magic show, I already know what the, what the problems are going to be going, Oh, this will be interesting. Magicians working with other people. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and if you don't have set etiquette as well, which is, again, we're not trained in this. It's not our normal stage. Right. right. But word of mouth, how I get other gigs is probably because, uh, so I'm told, I'm easy to work with. Right. In your experiences when you've been learning magic, what, what is the magic that challenged you the most? I know that you studied card magic the most, but is there a specific um, style of magic that you really struggled with that was more challenging than others? Um, I'd probably say close-up magic is always going to be harder technically because you've got, when you're performing close-up magic, people are right then, there on top of you, you know, so your slights have to be, have to be good enough that you could fool them right then and there. Right. Whereas on a bigger stage, you're kind of using misdirection in a different way to misdirect a massive group of people. Therefore, right. the magic you do is different or, or the techniques that you're using is different than doing close-up um, for, the, for the most part. So yeah, I would say close-up magic is probably the hardest thing to learn, yeah. especially with sleight of hand. Um, what would you say to somebody that's kind of starting out in magic? Let's say um, a new magician that just is interested. At, where would you suggest they start? Mm. Um, I would suggest they start. I mean, it's hard not to do the same thing that I was told, but I would be like, yeah, go get Royal Road Card Magic or Card College. If you're into cards, then those are the materials I would start studying from. But at the same time, don't just study that. I would say it's like we always hear, but no one ever really does. I'd be like, study other, other forms of performance, performance art, right? So 
go take voice lessons and I don't mean singing lessons, but like voice lessons and go take dance lessons and learn about yourself and who you are. Because if you can't be you naturally on stage, you're not going to be anything on stage. You're going to be an imitator of everybody else. Right. Um, that would probably be my best thing I would tell most young magicians. And I don't, at the same time, I would say, and don't listen to any other magicians. Just do what you want to do, you know, because I mean, there's a, there's a lot of good advice out there, but not all of it is great advice, yeah. <laughs> you know? So I think you just have to find your own voice with magic. And I think one of the main problems with magic is because there's one part of it where we're, we're technicians in a way, mm -hmm. you know, and then the other half is performance and not everyone can combine those two equally. Some of us are better technicians than performers and some of us are better performers than technicians. So you really got to know your strengths and weaknesses and, and if you're weak at one thing, then get really good at the other. Otherwise right. you get really bad magic, which is why I think there's a lot of stereotypes of, of magicians out there. Um, which the public seem to think that their image of magician is, you know, top hat, fluffy feather flowers, you right. know, it's all this like cliche kind of stuff, but we have ourselves to blame, really. Um, another really good resource, I would say, which is kind of new, it's only been around for maybe two or three years, is, uh, it's kind of like a Netflix for magicians, it's Steve Valentine's Magic on the Go, and <laughs> it's so cheap, but there's so much stuff, there's too much stuff for us. It's actually, I feel guilty subscribing to it right. um for what you're paying you're getting so much more you feel like you're reading books when you're learning with the with the content and and again he is someone that i would i would recommend to any magician because he's a pal of someone who can combine great technique with great performance into one right and there's very few i could say who can do that in our industry yeah. that i've seen and and one of the elements of your shows is your comedy element like you're just funny and clever and witty, but that's a muscle. That's something that has to be developed. Do you know, that's a good question. Cause I would have never considered or really thought of myself as a comedy magician in a way. Yeah. Um, and I'm not really like a joke writer. I don't like sit and go, I got to write a joke or, or what's funny. I think it's stuff that, that you'd kind of learn by performing, you know? Okay. So a lot of stuff ends up being scripted into your show because I've been improvising it or been doing whatever routine for so long that becomes kind of set in stone once you start learning what works. Mm -hmm. And then from that, you can find, you know, comedic moments and stuff, but it's not my objective when I'm writing routine going, okay, this has got to be funny. What's it got to be like, you know? So things come out of it as it, as it evolves. And then I guess for me, sometimes it ends up just being funny, yeah. <laughs> but it's never, yeah. it's never my intention from initially at all. I'm not ever trying to go, I need to do a comedy routine. It's yeah. more like, okay, what, how, what am I going to do? Yeah. So the comic relief is uh, actually a result of the workshopping and, 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 uh, and in elements that have happened within the show. And, and it just sort of, it's your natural, performance basically comes out I think yeah I think so I mean and there's other things I just have if I just have a passion for something that I that's not even magic that I want to put in my show sometimes yeah. that ends up being a funny bit like a quick example something I've been working on is I was doing some research on the uh, the carrot the carrot on the stick yes and uh and I was like what is this why do we know this as humans I don't know why and then I started researching it going it's kind of a got of a gray history in it you know, is it a reward or is it a punishment? But I'm like, visually, I just love the carrot on the stick. So it's not a trick, but how do I put that in my show? So I took a carrot on a stick and I would just walk around the city with it and see what, what comes. I'm like, all right, there's something with this. It gets attention. People recognize what it is, but it's not like you've ever really seen it in real life. Right. And then I would just have it on the side of the stage and just put it in my show whenever I felt like I could. So it's become like a tool, for example, when I want to find a volunteer and a lot of times, you know, people don't want to raise their hands. I go, no worries. I got perfect. I, I read this on the internet, which is totally true. And I take out my carrot on the stick. And I go, I need the perfect, I need the perfect person. Yeah, yeah. So something like that, which is yeah. really nothing and it's not magic ends up becoming this funny, weird little bit, but mostly because of my curiosity. Cause I've just, was like, I think I was having a conversation with a friend and yeah. I think he had said, we were talking about some kind of magic routine and he's like, Oh, it's like the carrot on the stick. I'm like, yeah, wait a second. Yeah. What is that? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So yeah, quirky, clever. Playing, really. <laughs> yeah. I don't. I don't know if I call it clever, but it's just playing. I just like if I'm yeah. curious about something, I'll always try to put it, 
put it in in some kind of way and then the job really is to try to make everything make sense right you know so I have a carrot in my show earlier in my show mm -hmm. in my like second routine I do a carrot does appear so now for instead of just throwing the carrot away now I just put it up on the end of the string on the stick and it just sits there but we already know the carrot exists right. so it has another life my prop has another life later on in the show right so yeah so now you've connected dots as well with carrot and stick yeah i try to reuse the same props that i have for other reasons within right. the show so that it's just not a prop just because it has to be from a magic trick essentially so which then i guess involves into other things then you end up in a way kind of telling the story Mm -hmm. um, with what you're doing on stage. Thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. No worries. I've got all the time in the world at the moment. Remember to subscribe and comment below.